and welcome to episode one here in the fall of 2020 to Raider Zone, now a podcast, so the first ever episode podcast version of Raider Zone here with Raider Student Media. I'm Wobrianza, your host. Alongside, I have a panel of Raiders, and guys, why don't we go ahead and introduce ourselves. Brendan, give us a little thing about you. Yeah, Brendan Devinney, uh senior Kind of still hanging around. Glad, glad it's my last year. <laughs> Riley. I'm Riley. I'm a junior. And I'm a sport business and marketing double major. And I like just talking sports with the boys. Ben. I'm Ben Johnson Bowers, an econ and uh, sport business double major. And I enjoy coaching. And Jacob. I'm Jacob Butar. I'm a freshman. I'm a sports business major, and I love everything and anything that has to do with the Cleveland Cavaliers. And so, just so you know, everybody, this is done virtually, obviously. Uh, A weird year we have going on here in 2020, and because of that, we cannot all be in the room at the same time, but we're going to make the most of what we can do, and we are going to have fun here on Microsoft Teams, that is granted access to us by the University of Mount Union, and that's how we're going to do our podcasts here on Raiders Zone. So we're going to jump right into it for the NFL. We are here in Northeast Ohio, so we'll start with the Browns. The Cleveland Browns hold on to defeat the Cincinnati Bengals 37-34 to on the road. Baker Mayfield starts 0-5 for 5 with a pick, finishes 22-23. of 23. That one incompletion is a spike, so I don't know if we even count that. For 297 yards and five touchdowns through the air, including a game winner to rookie Donovan Peoples-Jones with 11 seconds left. The Browns do, however, lose Odell Beckham Jr. to a torn ACL. So we'll go in the same order. Brendan, how big of a loss is Odell Beckham? Yeah, he's a big loss. um, When you talk about the chemistry of the team and having him there on the sidelines and on the field, you can't really match his energy um, and his passion for the game. You saw that in the Dallas game um, when he scored that game-winning touchdown running 70 yards. I don't think anyone else in the league can will uh, themselves to do that. But that being said, I don't think he's a big loss when you're talking about the offense. Um, It's statistically shown that Baker plays better when – OBJ is not on the field, Um, and I don't think it's going to be better now for Baker to be able to just go out there and and throw the ball, not having to have in the back of his mind that I got to make sure that I include Odell Beckham Jr. Because I feel like that has kind of stalled the offense at times um, with Baker's mindset out there on the field. So yeah, it, it. He's definitely a talented player. He's a big loss for the team. I hate to see it, um, but I just don't think it's going to really derail the offense. I think it might make it better. Riley. Um, I think that Odell's leadership is probably something that's a little bit underrated from outside of the organization. A lot of fans look at it as – Odell is like an interfering personality or personality that's just too big and too flashy. But when you see him on the sidelines, you can tell he wants to win, and that's something that a lot of teammates feed off of. So not having that guy that wants to win really bad, knowing that he can't compete, I think you lose a little bit of an edge. But like Brendan said, I I don't think you lose too much efficiency on offense. Maybe the downfield threat that you get one or two times a game, if you're lucky, is, is gone after losing Odell. But I feel like the intermediate passing game probably will improve. Uh, maybe not like the slant route, but out routes, that type of thing. I don't think Odell's elite in those categories. I think he brings a lot to the quick routes and the downfield strikes. But I don't know. I, I do think it's a pretty big loss leadership-wise, but not talent-wise. Ben. <sighs> I don't think it's that big a loss, honestly. I think statistically, Brendan said, you know, Baker has been better without Odell on the field. And a lot of that probably comes down to just not thinking you have to force the ball to him to keep him happy, to give him his uh, his targets and a chance to get his stats. 
to make himself look good. Uh, but leadership wise, that's not going to be lost that much. He's still going to be a practice, still on the sidelines. So I don't think they lose too much from that perspective. So I honestly don't think this hurts the Browns that much. They may even play better as a result of him not being on the field. Jacob? Yeah, I agree with Ben on that. Um, Baker's not going to have to force the ball to. If you look back at Baker Mayfield's rookie season, who do you have success with? He had success with Jarvis Landry, Rashad Perriman, and Hollywood Higgins. And really, I mean, Perriman and Higgins aren't over-the-top elite wide receivers, but Baker still had a lot of success with them. I think he can find that with Higgins and Donovan Peoples-Jones and still with Jarvis Landry there. And, too, this is more of a run-based team, if we're being honest. So he can just ride Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt, and hopefully the other receivers can pick up the slack. And guys like Austin Hooper and Harrison Bryant can be efficient. So I don't really think this affects the offense all that much. Yeah, and I agree with a little piece of everything you said. It's obviously you hear a guy like Odell Peckham Jr. goes down. Um, it's going to hurt you a little bit. But, I mean, looking at that game, he threw that pick with Odell on the field. Odell got hurt getting the tackle, and uh, then Baker ends up going after he departs uh, 22 of 27 overall for 297 yards, five touchdowns, wins the game. Um, I think it is that that mentality a little bit where you don't have to force it to him. Um, obviously, he explained how unhappy he was with targets last year, and you saw Baker start to force the ball more, and he's still doing a little bit this year, and it leads to some of the interceptions. And it led to this one here against the Bengals, and so in that aspect, we might be we might see a little bit of rookie Baker, the, the guy that was settled in, woke up feeling dangerous, and didn't have to worry about the big ego on the field. But then again, Odell still has that big play ability, uh, like he in the first Bengals game when Jarvis threw him a touchdown pass. That's the thing you're gonna miss. Um, now you look at the Browns wide receiver room, you still got Jarvis Landry. You still got Rashard Higgins, who I think is a pretty good two for most teams. And then Donovan People Jones showed that he could be of some worth. You still have a few other guys, and like Jacob said, the tight end room is stacked, so you don't have to worry about that. So overall, I don't think it's as big of a loss as you would think when you hear the name Odell going down. Now, if he was still in the Giants, that's like hearing Saquon went down, hearing Odell went down, because he was the Giants playmaker. Um, so Continuing on with the Browns, what does this kind of comeback win, not really comeback, it was a, a back and forth affair, I should say, but what kind of win, uh, how, what does this mean for Baker winning this game, pulling it off, and having the game he did? Jacob, we'll start with you. Okay, we'll go Brendan. Yeah, um, I think for Baker, it, it gives him the confidence that he can remain in the pocket, be calm and collect himself, and make the big time throws. Um, those two throws at the end of the ball game there um, to hit to Higgins and uh, Peoples Jones, those are the two biggest throws that he's had this year. Um, maybe. You throw in that one that he had to back him in the Cincinnati game at home, um, but it was all all year long. We've been talking about how Baker can't um, play in the fourth quarter. Um, the, that four game win streak, it, it, the opponent was still in the ball game in that fourth quarter, and the offense didn't really help the defense out. Now you have um, Baker have a game winning drive with less than two minutes to go in the game um, that we haven't seen from him in a really long time. We didn't see it at all last year. Um, I can't remember the last time that we saw it from him. Um, so, I mean, it, it was shades of Baker Mayfield at Oklahoma. Um, it was beautiful to see. And definitely, now, now here's the thing. Can he do that against a really good team like Las Vegas? Can he do that against a really good team in Tennessee? Um we haven't really seen him perform like he did yesterday against teams that are going to be in the playoffs and make uh, a Super Bowl run. The two games against Baltimore and Pittsburgh are examples of that. Have not seen him play well enough against uh, the, the 
blue bloods of the NFL. So I think he has to now be consistent and take this game and carry that momentum and prove to the NFL that he can be an elite quarterback. Jacob, we'll go up to you now. Yeah, I think it's a confidence booster for sure, not just with Baker, but for Browns fans. Um, But really, I want to see him do it a lot more. Like how Brendan said, he showed flashes of his Oklahoma days, and I think that really benefited him in this game. But can he keep it up? Because I don't know about you guys, but as a Browns fan, I'm very sick and tired of seeing all these different like progressive commercials he's on and getting all that fame before he's really proven himself, I feel. So really, I think that he needs to keep building on this and like being way more consistent with it. If he has a good string of games like this, then I'll be fully sold on him. I'm still not fully sold at the, sold at the moment, but definitely there is some promise after this performance. Ben. No, I think he with five touchdowns yesterday, delivering in the clutch repeatedly, especially after getting a, having a star wide receiver go down. I think that really kind of silenced the critics. At least for a little bit, it should. But like Brendan said, he's going to have to start backing us up against better teams like Las Vegas, which is coming up this week at home before we head into the bye week. I think he has to do that. But if he can step up and play even sort of like that, about seventy five percent of how he played Sunday, I think that should shut the, the critics up at least for the rest of the year if he can consistently do that through the rest of the stretch of the season. Riley. Uh, I personally still have deep-rooted concerns about Baker Mayfield. And I want to mention, like, I like Baker Mayfield. I'm definitely a Browns fan. So this is just from an area of reality. We still haven't seen Baker Mayfield play four quarters of consistent football for an entire game from top to bottom have just – a shout-out performance. Yeah, we saw three quarters of that yesterday, but we know he's capable of that already. So I think, yeah, after last week's ugly performance, it shuts the, the critics up for a little bit. But until I can see him consistently play four quarters of good football week in and week out, I'm really going to have a hard time trusting Baker Mayfield to take the Cleveland Browns to the next step as an organization. Yeah, when I uh, when I think about this game and Baker Mayfield, I think it takes him off the hot seat that I thought he never really belonged on. I mean, you look at his career compared to Drew Brees or Brett Favre through the same amount of starts. He's putting up better number, and you got to think about the fact that Baker Mayfield has played for four coaches already. He's memorized three playbooks already. He's played in three systems. Um, it's just. That blows my mind that, yeah, it hasn't been the greatest first three years, but the fact that he's still putting up numbers and doing better than any Browns quarterback has done since 1999 with the circumstances he's under, I think he deserves a continued chance. And after one, two bad games in Pittsburgh and Baltimore, you don't say, okay, it's time to to, to change route. He has the Browns sitting at 5-2. and two. I don't even think that's a feat that they've had since the 80s. So, uh I like what he's done. He knows what he has to do to win. When he has Chubb, he knows he doesn't have to perform as well. But uh, he stepped up big in these last few weeks without Chubb. Yes, the Pittsburgh game. But we'll get to Pittsburgh. They look like a whole different monster right now. Um, but for me, I think Baker's playing really well. And guys, if, if you ever need to interject, go ahead and turn the mic off and say something. Yeah, I understand where you're coming from. But... The landscape of the NFL today is you might have a guy that's good or slightly above average, but if your team's not going to win a championship, you're going to have to know to move on. The Kansas City Chiefs acknowledge that in fact. I, th- I don't think Baker Mayfield's a bad quarterback. I think he's putting up great numbers. But when push comes to shove, you have to beat winners. And if he doesn't start doing that, then I mean, Cleveland's going to have to look for a quarterback that is going to carry them to a championship. That's the ultimate end goal for every professional football team. And I get what you're saying. So I, I do agree with that. Obviously, it's all about winning championships. And I think Baker can get to that that, that part of his career. Um, is this year the year? I don't know. We'll see. It is 2020. It's a weird year. The Browns have never won a Super Bowl, so maybe with the weird year, this is the year they do it. Maybe not. But uh, 
Looking at the other quarterback from this Browns-Bengals game, Joe Burrow. Man, he's amazing in the loss, which seems to be a reoccurring theme for the young fella. Uh, Seems to be putting his team in winning situations week in and week out, but the defense uh, just not there. He goes 35 of 47 for 406 yards to the air with three touchdowns, and yes, did have a pick. So guys, this is a yes or no question, just quick shoot off. Is Joe Burrow your Offensive Rookie of the Year through seven weeks, Riley. Not quite. Okay. Who is then? I think we have to acknowledge Justin Jefferson and what he's accomplished this year so far. Okay, I can back that. Brendan. His, the numbers are there, but the results aren't, so I'm saying no. Okay, Jacob? I would say no. I think Justin Herbert deserves more credit, so Justin Herbert's my pick right now. Wow, sleeper pick. Ben? Um, Yeah, I mean, numbers-wise, I think he is right now, but he's not getting the wins right now. Justin Herbert probably could win it just because he is having more success as a team, but I think it's going to come down to those two when it's all said and done. Now, I will note Joe Burrow, yes, one five and one, but Justin Herbert's two and four. And then Riley, on your point, Justin Jefferson's one and five. So really, if you look at it, a lot of these, I mean, but then again, a quarterback's sp- supposed to have a better war than a wide receiver. So that's where your point comes in valid, Riley. But really, a lot of these rookies that are stepping up that are in the discussion of that rookie of the year, none of their teams are performing very well. Um, I, I do think that Justin Herbert makes his football team a lot more competitive yeah. than if he weren't on the field. I like, Justin Jefferson mm-hmm. isn't going to win Minnesota football games, but Justin Herbert, I will give him the fact that he is going to win the Chargers football games that they have no business winning, to, winning at points. Yeah, and I have not picked right now mainly because – Austin Eckler, when he went down, I thought the Chargers were really done for on offense, but they're still moving the ball on offense, and I think it has a lot to do with Herbert. Yeah, he had a really good game last uh, yesterday, I should say, not last week, but yesterday. And like the takes, guys, so let's move on to our next <clears throat> game that we highlight here. The Pittsburgh Steelers remain perfect as they defeat the who once was perfect Tennessee Titans 27-24. Ben Roethlisberger throws three picks in the win as the Titans outscore the Steelers 21 zip in the second half, but come up short and come back. So with that being said, guys, yes, they won. It was a little shaky of a second half. Are the Steelers the best team in football right now? We'll start with you, Ben. Honestly, they might. Honest. I mean, that pass rush for them is its a very good pass rush. It's going to eat you up if you don't come out ready to play. And then offensively, they're humming. They've got a lot of different guys getting in on the action. And Big Ben's playing pretty darn well for a guy who's coming off an elbow surgery and has been in the league since 2004. So getting up there towards the end of his career. Yeah, I mean, I got to say, they're probably the best team in the league from a personnel standpoint right now. Riley? I do think that the Pittsburgh Steelers are the best team in the NFL right now. They certainly have the best defense, and defense definitely wins championships. If It doesn't matter how good an offense is. If your defense is able to stop them from scoring, uh, you're going to win just about every time. But what determines if the Steelers are ultimately the best team is what version of Ben Roethlisberger shows up on the field every Sunday. Um I mean, he's going to have games where he doesn't play as well anymore because the athleticism is starting to decline a little bit. But he's also one of the most cerebral players on an on a NFL football field every Sunday. So depending on what Ben Roethlisberger you get, Pittsburgh is the best team in the NFL. Okay. Brendan? Um, I mean, record-wise, sure. Um, but I still am a firm believer that Kansas City is the toughest team to beat in the league. Um, that loss against Las Vegas, an off day. I mean, but they still put up 32 points. 
um, the Raiders offense that they just were, was not going to get stopped. Yeah, the Steelers do have a good offense. Deontay Johnson is playing out of his mind right now. Um, Juju Smith-Schuster is still an underrated wide receiver, in my opinion. But I think what we saw from the Cleveland game last week, if you create hell for Ben Roethlisberger, you put him off his game. And if that pocket collapses against Big Ben, he's not the same Roethlisberger 10, 15 years ago. So, I, I mean, yeah, I think they can make it run at the AFC Championship game, um, but I don't think that they're the best team in the league right now. Jacob? I think at the moment they are. Um, I love their defense. I think it's one of the best, if not the best, in the NFL. I like their weapons, like with Chase Claypool and Juju and Deontay Johnson and, of course, like James Conner and those guys. But I still think in the end, like how Brendan said, Kansas City is ultimately going to end up being the team. Like if you look at the Chiefs last year, I know it was mainly because Patty Mahomes went down with the injury, but they weren't the best team in the AFC throughout the regular season last year. So I think in the end it's going to end up being Kansas City. But at the moment, because of the defense and the offensive weapons, it's definitely the Steelers are the best team at the moment. I love the take, guys. I'm going <clears> to <throat> take a little bit again from from all the takes. Uh, right now, yes, I think the I mean they're undefeated, so obviously best record in football. But um, just that defense, uh, the defensive line forces quarterbacks to throw the ball when they don't want to, and the secondary is so good that it takes advantage. Uh, like last week against the Browns, Mika Fitzpatrick pick six. Uh, TJ Watt, a man there on the left side that just bursts through the line. It seems like he's in the backfield every single play. And they definitely do have the talent on offense uh, to keep winning ball games as well. And right now I do, th- yes, but I agree. I think the Chiefs, uh, not only the best team in the AFC, but I think the Chiefs overall are the best team in the NFL when you think about uh, overall team and then having Andy Reid as a coach. I mean, he's a wizard of a coach. That's why he's been able to do it for so long. Finally gets a Super Bowl ring, and now he's running on confidence too. So um, right now the Steelers are the best team, but ask me again in 10 weeks and we'll see what I say. Now going to the other team, the Titans, they fall to 5-1. and one. Where do you have them ranked in football right now? Uh, top 10, top 5, or are they second behind the Steelers if you said the Steelers are the best? Riley, we'll start with you. Where do you have the Titans ranked right now in football? I think the Titans are definitely like a borderline top five team in football. I mean, they have a solid defense. They have a good pass rush. Jeffrey Simmons has come back, and he's playing insane, so much so that they traded Jarrell Casey over the summer. He was a stalwart at the defensive end position and D-tackle position for them. But Jeffrey Simmons playing great. Uh, They've also got who's their safety Kevin Bayard, he's one of the best safeties in the NFL. So I think on the defensive side of the ball, they're never going to let up more than 30 points. And then offensively, Ryan Tannehill and Derrick Henry, that's like the perfect complementary pairing in the backfield. A running back who's always going to get it done and a quarterback who's always going to get it done. They might not post eye-popping stats, but they're going to play well every week. And I mean, most weeks just are not going to end up as a loss for the Tennessee Titans. Ben. I think they got to be top five. If they aren't, they're top. They're six, because Derrick Henry is I mean, that's a big dude. I don't know if you how, if you've seen a picture. There's a picture of him. Like he's a massive dude. And just saying, it doesn't really do him justice. But he's a very strong, powerful runner. Ryan Tannehill's been dealing so far this year. So I think they got a good one-two punch. If you defend too much, load up against the run, they're going to kill you kill you through the air. If you try and load up. To defend the pass, you're going to just run it down your throat with Henry. So I think they're a very deadly team. Uh, they need to lose ultimately to win, but I think they're going to win a lot more games this year, and they should be a very dangerous team when the playoffs start in January. Jacob. So, yeah, I actually ranked the teams in order of like what I think is the best right now. Um, I have the Steelers at one, the Chiefs at two, the Buccaneers at three, the Seahawks at four, and then the Titans at five. I think that with Derrick Henry, this offense is always going to have 
a guy that's just going to lead it in the best way possible. Ryan Tannehill surprising me with his play this year. I did not expect him to bounce back from the playoffs, or I should say carry on what he had in the playoffs. Um, and that defense, like how Riley said, it, it's a really good defense. And I'm expecting the Titans to make another deep playoff run, maybe an AFC championship appearance, but they're definitely going to um, keep winning games. Brendan. Yeah, I think they're the sixth best team in the league right now. Um, Derrick Henry is is carrying the load right now and finishing where he left off last year. That Buffalo game, Ryan Tannehill just made throws that I hadn't seen from him in a long time. Um, he was really putting the team on his shoulders that night. But you look at the teams that they've played, I'm not really – sold on them being able to be a Super Bowl team right now. I mean, they crushed – well, not, they didn't crush, but let Houston be in that game the whole game. Um, Denver was a close win. Jacksonville was a close win, and so was Minnesota. And then they lose to what we've been debating is the best team in the league in Pittsburgh right now. So not – I mean, the only convincing win right now is Buffalo. Um, so not totally sold on Tennessee. Um, they got to beat the best to be the best. And right now they're barely beating sub 500 teams. So, yeah. And I thought the same thing as you, Brendan, when I, when I was looking at Tennessee Titans, I was like, okay, they barely beat the Vikings. They, they barely beat this team. They barely beat that the Jacksonville, Houston, like you're right. But uh, it might, might be the same case as Cleveland but, where they get good offense, but their yeah. defense is but an average team, and I thought maybe last year the playoff run was like a little bit of like just running on adrenaline, but you don't do that to a Buffalo team unless you're a top five team. Um, I would say they're, they're four or five in my rankings. I mean, Buffalo's defense was rated second in the NFL coming into the season behind Pittsburgh, and he, they totally shredded that defense. And then you look at uh, the Bills' offense, the Titans, now you speak on the Titans' defense, the Bills... Josh Allen has had his way until that Tennessee game, and he couldn't get anything going. Uh, I think Tennessee, that was a big game for me, improving what their value is as far as a competitor. And sitting at 5-1, and one, there's no doubt in my mind right now that they should end up on top of the AFC South. And um, obviously the Colts right now, the only competition they have when it comes to the AFC South, which we'll get into later, the divisions ranking or division standings later, but... Uh, I think Tennessee is a legit contender right now, and uh, that Buffalo game proved it, and then uh, not giving up against a Steelers team proved it. I mean, they put 21 up unanswered on uh, the only undefeated team left and arguably the best defense in football um, and almost came back to win the game. So uh, Tennessee, definitely a team that I'm looking forward to watch more as the season goes on. So we'll move on to the... Next game, we're going to probably highlight five games a week every week, guys, just so you know. Uh, these were the five that I thought were worth talking about. The Washington football team takes down the Cowboys. How about them, Cowboys? 25-3 uh, to three is the final score. Andy Dalton goes down with an injury. Uh, is questionable for next week against the Eagles with a concussion. Uh, but still, it did not look. he did not look good against the Cardinals, and he did not look good before the injury here against the football team. Uh, are the Cowboys done? Riley, we'll start with you. Uh, I thought the Cowboys have been done. They've been <laughs> in a pretty bad position <laughs> for most of the season. And, I mean, they are in the worst division in football, so there's a chance they could turn it around. But the way this offense looks without Dak Prescott is pretty sad, and I just don't think you're going to be able to be as efficient as you were under him. Your defense is cheesecloth. It's Swiss cheese. Um, it's wet paper, and there's <laughs> boulders falling on it. There's just no stopping offenses in Dallas. So, uh, yeah, they're done. They don't, they don't have a competitive football team at all. And Mike McCarthy is a terrible hire. Uh, he's looked like the most inept coach in football this year. And if Jerry Jones is a smart businessman, which I suspect that he is, you make the Steve Wilkes decision and you just cut him after a year. You know, that's not a right fit. So uh, that's where the Cowboys are headed. 
Yeah, the Cowboys. Now there's there there was a uh, player saying that this is the most unprepared coaching staff that they've ever played for. Saying that the coaches come in and they feel like they don't even know what's going on. So I can I can agree with that, Mike McCarthy. Take that. It's got to be a one and done year. I mean, what have you been? He claimed all the stuff that he was doing with his time off since being let go from the Packers, and none of it is relaying over to his second chance here in Dallas. And Ryan, I'm going to stick it with. I'm going to stick to you as well. Is there a quarterback that the Dallas Cowboys could try to go out and get that could help turn things around? I have been looking at some backup scenarios in the NFL. I don't think that the Cowboys are going to actively seek uh, a quarterback that can really win them football games because at this point they are going to have a good draft pick. And if they decide that Dak isn't where they want to go, especially after his injury, they can draft someone or they can trade for assets, which is a huge deal. So I'm looking at established veteran backups. I like Colt McCoy. He's with the Giants right now. I think he could probably be had for a very late round pick. And then any combination of the 49ers backups, whether it's Nick Mullins or C.J. Bethard, those guys are both going to be established veterans that you can plug and play and at least remain somewhat watchable for your fans. All right, we'll go to Jacob. Same thing. Are the Cowboys done? And if it's a quarterback who do you think they could reach out and get to fill that void? Um, yeah, the Cowboys aren't winning a playoff game. I mean, they're just not. They don't have the talent. But in the NFC least, uh, I don't really want to count them out quite yet. I can see them definitely like winning the division with a horrible record. Just because, I mean, I've never seen a division as terrible as the NFC East this year. It's just pathetic. So, I think the Eagles ultimately take it, though. Yeah, I agree with you on that. They have the most talented roster when healthy. Yeah, I think the Eagles will ultimately, but I think the Cowboys can hang around there for a little bit and maybe challenge them. Uh, But, yeah, I agree that the Eagles will most likely end up winning the division. And quarterbacks, this is going to be a really hot take, but Colin Kaepernick, I mean, maybe give him a call. Maybe just a little one-year rental might work for him, might work for the Cowboys fan base. I also look at a guy like Blake Bortles, potentially. I know he gets a really bad rep, but, I mean, when you already have basically a wash season, like, why not just bring in a guy like Blake Bortles off the free agent market? Um, But, yeah, they're definitely not going to win a playoff game, and they might win the division, but ultimately I don't think they end up winning the division either. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Was Bortles ever picked up? I know they talked about the Broncos picking up. Was he ever picked up? I I don't think I, yeah. I don't think so. So he's I still a free agent. I couldn't remember. Rams still as a backup. Yeah, I know they no, were he talking. Got cut by the Rams, I know. Okay, I know they were talking about bringing him in when Drew Locke went down. I didn't know if that ever happened. Yeah. Um. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I I like that cap pick too as well because if the Cowboys, they're at the point in the season where like, yes, there's a fighting chance you make it in the NFC East, but. What's the quality of team going into the playoffs? So why not take that risk and maybe even resurrect a guy's career? You know what I mean? So I like that pick. Ben, we'll go to you. Yeah, I think you you just fire Mike McCarthy. He's terrible. I mean, he's god-awful. He doesn't have his team ready to play. I mean, you just got to cut ties, honestly, at this point. I mean, if not now, it's at the end of the season. So it's just a matter of when Jerry wants to let him go. I I think, think, you're calling for a midseason fire think, here. I think the Cowboys are going to end up fire sailing. I think that they might be going through rebuild a lot sooner than people think so. Because it's not just a problem with the coaching with Mike McCarthy. When you're starting safety that you took in the, the, fir- the second round, I believe, a few years ago, or like the end of the first a few years ago, says it's impossible to go 100% every play. And former NFL players are saying this guy's a chump. It's like problems with your roster and with your coaching staff. So Dallas is going to have to start trading people and cutting people and getting rid of bad contracts, and then they're going to have a new coaching staff without their quarterback. So it's going to be a rough scene in Dallas, I think, over the next year or two. Brendan. Instead of repeating what everyone has already said and even answering your question, I'm going to make the case that 
we've seen this too many times when divisions have all four teams below 500 and at this point in the season not even two wins that the NFL even Major League Baseball should go and do what the NBA does take the eight best teams from each conference each league and those are your best teams no none of the teams from the NFC East deserve to be in the playoff this year and I don't think anyone wants to see them in the playoff so that's just my rant right there and I hate when this kind of stuff happens but I don't know if any of you guys agree with that but that's just that's where I'm at when these kind of situations occur. I mean, honestly, I'm here for it. I think it makes sense. Like, the Browns are 5-2. and two. They only got two teams in the league that have more wins. But they'd be a wild card right now. It wouldn't even be the first wild card. And like you said, I mean, the NFC East doesn't deserve to have a playoff team this year. I mean, all four of them are god-awful. So, I think it's a good idea, honestly. Yeah, I agree with that. that that's yeah, I, one thing I've always – sorry about that, Dave. That's one thing I've always liked about the NBA's format is – you don't take the the six division winners. You just take the, the eight best from each conference. And there's even been talks that you take the 16 best from the NBA because the West tends to have better teams. Um, and it's just the same situation here. Um, and it's going to be weird. It, it, it's, it sucks mainly because whoever that team that gets to play them, it's almost a bye week, you know? And so I agree. Maybe you, you look at changing the format, play, the playoff format, and go from there. But it, it seems like there's always one division. And a lot of the times it seems like it's the NFC East that's that division. Jacob, what were you going to say? Oh, uh, yeah. I was going to say I think it's unfair like to reward. Right now it would be the Eagles with a home playoff game at 2-4-1 and four and one, when they'd basically be playing the Green Bay Packers who are 5-1 and one, and so much more deserve a home playoff game. So I agree. You have to have like the six or eight best teams uh, just seated how they are because it's just not right. A team that's that bad gets a home playoff game with all that advantage. It's just not right. Yeah, and going off what Ben said, uh, complete or whoever said talked about the complete. It might have been Riley and Ben combined. The complete rebuild starting now for the Cowboys. You got to feel for guys like Ezekiel Elliott, Jalen Smith, uh, Zach Martin, Amari Cooper. Uh, some of those guys that are just such big names and produce so much, but due to the circumstances that they're under, they have to be a part of that or even potentially shipped out. But uh, Some of those contracts are the reason why the Cowboys are in the position they're in, though. Yeah. So it's like it, you have to feel bad for those guys because they want to compete, but when you're going for the contracts, you can't get teammates that are good enough to support you to win a championship. Yeah, I see that point as well. Now, when I look at quarterbacks, a couple guys that I th- think the Cowboys could potentially should potentially reach out to, Ryan Fitzpatrick and Tyrod Taylor. Two guys that lost spots, two guys that are hungry, and what do you got to lose? I mean, Ryan Fitzpatrick, I, th- I, I still can't get over that. I think he was playing really well in Miami, had them at 3-3. Three and three. Um, They're going into a contest here against... Uh, the Rams, who, yes, the Rams are 4-2 and two and then play tonight, uh, but I think they've had a very lackluster schedule thus far, and I think the Dolphins could have somehow squeaked that off, go 4-3. and three. Um, But nonetheless, the decision's made, so Ryan Fitzpatrick, I think, is a guy maybe the Cowboys reach out to. So moving on to game number four that we're highlighting, the Jets remain winless as they lose to Buffalo 18-10, now, here's the kicker. The Bills get it. The kicker. Here's the kicker. Uh, the Bills win on six field goals. And, uh, guys, are the Jets bound to be the third 0-16 team in NFL history? Brendan, we'll start with you. At this rate, yeah, they are. Um, shut out against Miami. Um, let up, Don't even let up a touchdown to Buffalo, and you still lose. Um just, I mean, they got Kansas City next week, <laughs> and then and then New Game England the before the. I, I know New England isn't the same New England as we've seen, but that's still a Bill Belichick we're facing. Um, and then the back half of their schedules doesn't get any nicer. Uh, Las Vegas, Miami again, 
Seattle, uh, Cleveland, I don't see a win. I don't see a win on this schedule that the way that they're – and their losses haven't even been close. Um, blowout loss against Arizona. Blowout loss against Indy. Uh, San Francisco. It's not pretty. Definitely not pretty. So I think pretty soon we'll be uh, welcoming uh, – New York to the fraternity of winless teams. So, yeah. Riley. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't see a win in their schedule at all. They face a lot of really hard teams. And the only, like, winnable games that they even had, in my opinion, were in the preseason, which was canceled anyways. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, the Jets are just a pretty bad team, and they're definitely the worst roster I've seen in pro football since – our Browns went winless, and uh, there's just no good outcome here for the New York Jets. Jacob? I mean, I agree. I think that there's a very strong possibility, but it is really, really hard, I think, to go winless. I think that they could potentially catch a team that's sleeping on them, and maybe they just have a really on day, and the team that they play has a really off day, and they get a win that way. The only game on here that I see that they have the slimmest chance of winning, just straight up, I think, would be the Chargers, but that's even really pushing it. But, yeah, I think there's definitely a strong chance, but they can definitely catch a team sleeping, I think, and potentially get a win that way. Ben? All right. Uh, yeah, I think they go on 16. I mean, looking at ESPN's power index, the lowest percent chance that a team has remaining on their schedule to beat them is 67, and that's Las Vegas. So just based off that, they're going 0-16, because I think the most winnable game is maybe the Chargers game, maybe the Pats game that's coming up in three weeks. But, man, this is a terrible roster. They got rid of Le'Veon, which well, he wasn't producing a ton, but that still hurts you. And, man, Sam Darnold has not had a great year as the quarterback for the Jets. So it's tough for me seeing them – I think they're lucky if they win one game. I really think they're going on 16. Yeah, and I think a lot of it has to do with coaching there. Adam Gase should be on his way out soon. So we'll move on to what ended up being uh, the game of the night. Sunday night football. The Cardinals and Seahawks. By the way, the Seahawks, I don't think they're capable of playing a normal game. But uh, the Cardinals come back and win in overtime 37-34. The Seahawks... Led by 10 with six minutes left. Uh, the Cardinals now 5-2 and two are just half a game behind the Seahawks who are 5-1. and one. Are the Cardinals a legit contender with a 5-2 and two record through seven games? Ben, we'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, I think early on here through the first half of the schedule, 5-2, and two, they look nice. That connection with Ky between Kyler and DeAndre Hopkins looks nice. Uh, we even caught Kyler on camera laughing yesterday when he saw DeAndre going for the end zone and man coverage. So I think that offensively they're very dangerous. Buda Baker on the defensive end for them looks nice. So I think they can definitely make some noise, and if not this year, then next year, possibly get over the top. Riley? Uh, I do think the Cardinals have a really good roster. I don't like their linebacking core very much on defense. I feel like uh, once you look at their their three guys in the center of the field or four guys that they have covering the center of the field, you, you're you left unimpressed. So that's kind of their, their biggest flaw in my opinion. But with Kyler Murray at quarterback, anything's possible. He's had some accuracy issues, but when he comes into really important games, he lives up to expectations. So I think Arizona's a pretty dangerous football team. Brendan. Yeah, I think when all is said and done at the end of the year, they might sneak in as a wild card team. Um, I, I like their roster. I think Kyler Murray is really emerging as the quarterback that we've expected him to be uh, since he got drafted. Um, like we said, DeAndre Hopkins and Chase Edmonds, uh, they're two uh, leading receivers. Throw in Larry Fitzgerald. Their offense is pretty hard to stop, and even – uh, when you got that um, running game going with Kenyon Drake, it's they're an offense that really plays well and meshes with each other. Very, very comp 
complimentary, complimentary offense. Um, I mean, their defense didn't play well last night, but that's Seattle. I don't know if any defense can play well against Seattle. Um, I don't want to say that they they were lucky to win that, that game last night. Um, I think that's just one of those games that was a dogfight to begin with. Um, coming back against 10, coming back down 10 to Seattle, um, you got to hand it to them. I mean, that's all. that was all Kyler Murray there. So played his heart out and really showed that Arizona can be dangerous. Jacob? Yeah, I think it's a good look into the future myself. Personally, I don't see them as like Super Bowl contenders this year. I definitely see them as a potential wild card. They still play in a really tough division. Like They're going to have to play the Seahawks again. They're going to have to play the Rams twice, and they have to play the 49ers again. So they might stumble there. Kenny and Drake, I know, did go down with an injury, and he's expected to miss a couple weeks too. So that could hurt him. But, yeah, I definitely think that this is a look into the future. And the Cardinals, with the talent they have on offense and some of the talent they have on defense, can be contenders in the next coming years. Yeah, and I agree. Uh, they added a couple big pieces on defense. Chandler Jones continues to be the most underrated edge rusher in football, in my opinion. Um, great secondary. Patrick Peterson's a leader. Buda Baker's an upcoming star. Um, surprising that the lack of um, game time and what we're hearing from their first pick and Isaiah Simmons not playing much. Um, but nonetheless, they have the weapons. Adding Hopkins was huge. Um, and I think this Cardinals team, yes, I think they can be a legit contender. Again, I, like you guys, I don't know about Super Bowl, maybe next year, but they have a great coach in Bruce Arians, so don't count them out. Or, sorry, Bruce Arians is with the Buccaneers. They have a great coach in Cliff Kingsbury, who I think is finally – I think they're all finally buying into him. And uh, Kingsbury, a guy I liked out of college, a college signing, uh, you don't you don't see a lot of them succeed. But I think Kingsbury in this situation is doing really well with a young team and uh, using the veterans to help develop the young guys. And I think the Cardinals, um, maybe not this year, but again in the future, they, they could be that team in the NFC West and in the NFC in general that teams got to look out for. Now... Moving on to some other news. Sorry, I was reading about the Buccaneers here, and that's why Bruce Harrians popped my head. But the Buccaneers making some free agency moves as they sign Antonio Brown to a one-year deal. Uh, he's now following the COVID-19 protocols and will be activated for their Week 9 matchup against the Saints. Riley, we'll start with you. Is this a good signing, and what does this mean for guys like Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, and Scotty Miller? Um... I mean, for the Buccaneers, it's high risk, high reward. I mean, actually, I, I rescind that statement because they aren't even paying him that much. So you're paying him to either produce at an elite level or do nothing but be an annoyance for a few weeks until you cut him from your football team. So I don't really see a lose for the Buccaneers here. So, yeah, I'll call it a good signing. In terms of what it means for Evans, Godwin, and Scotty Miller – I think Scotty Miller's role has obviously decreased drastically with the arrival of Antonio Brown because they're going to probably put Antonio Brown in the slaughter out wide and have him do a lot of short concept routes or just run deep and get ready for the bomb. So uh, that's that's going to reduce Scotty Miller's role pretty heavily in Tampa. Brendan? Yeah, I kind of agree with Riley. Um it's going to be interesting to see what kind, what version of Antonio Brown we get. Um, you saw tape of him uh, practicing over the offseason with Russell Wilson. Um, so we don't know. You'd expect that he is in good shape. I don't. I wouldn't think Tampa Bay takes him if he isn't um, in prime A-B shape. Um, so I agree with Riley. It's going to be interesting to see what kind of what this means for the guys on offense already. Um, it's, I think it's what Tom Brady needs. Um, I mean, really Leonard Fournette is really the only star wide receiver that they have right now. Chris Godwin has been playing well, uh, but I think you just need another playmaker on that offense for Tampa Bay to take the next step. And if Brown is able to do that for them, then they become 
even more dangerous. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see how he plays. Um, I was surprised when I heard this news. I didn't think AB was going to be in the league anytime soon, but they have different thoughts and opinions down there in Florida. Jacob. Yeah, I mean, if he comes in and does his job like he should, it's a perfect signing for them. I mean, I don't think you'd ever see a more lethal combination of receivers and tight ends. Just think about it. You'd have Gronk, Mike Evans, Chris Godwin, and Antonio Brown all on the same team. That's just crazy to think. Um, But he can very well come in and disrupt the locker room chemistry that they've been trying to form if he comes in and is like his Raiders and Patriots self. So that's where it's the high risk. But definitely the rewards, like I think, are more than the potential risks that are involved. Um, But yeah, Scotty Miller, his role is basically gone in my opinion. It's going to be Antonio Brown, Mike Evans, and Chris Godwin for the foreseeable future. Ben. I like the signing. I really do. I think there's some good chemistry between Tom Brady and Antonio Brown. Obviously, it's going to hurt Miller. His role is going to be greatly diminished now that AB is coming into town. And obviously, for Mike Evans and Chris Godwin, they're not going to be getting as many touches as they would before. But I think most people would probably trade touches in exchange for wins, and I think that's what they're going to get. They're going to continue to roll. And it's easy to forget how dominant Antonio Brown was before his mental health and off-the-field antics kind of derailed him for for a season or so. But this is a very dominant receiver. Tom Brady reportedly was once told to stop throwing to him in Patriots practice because he was so dominant going deep. So I think this is going to work out really well for him. Yeah, I think uh, it's the same thing you guys said. He, he's obviously going to be a liability, um, but the potential for greatness is there. Um, I think this hurts Tom Brady more than anything because um, you talk about that legacy. Does he need Belichick to win? But now he moves to Tampa Bay where there was already a lot of pieces, and he's they're adding more, and it kind of makes you feel like, Brady, can you do it on your own? Um, but And also, going back to what I already said this, Arians, a great coach. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if this is helping Brady's legacy. Obviously, he'll always be in the GOAT talk when you have that many rings. I mean, they don't even fit on one hand. But the help is definitely there, and if he was heading to Tampa Bay to prove that he doesn't need help, I don't think he's doing a very good job at it. But it also, I agree, Miller's position's kind of gone, and Evans and Godwin, the guys who we haven't seen put up the big numbers per usual just because of the amount of weapons that are down there, now they're adding another one. I think this hurts their numbers as well. Um, but then again, it, it could help the team get over that hump to win the Super Bowl. So now moving on, Cam Newton gets benched and the Patriots lost after three picks. He gets benched for Jarrett Stidham. Patriots now under 500 through six games for the first time since before Tom Brady, um, which I believe is before a couple of us were even born. So um, that's how long it's been um, since they sat below 500 through six games. Guys, is Cam's job in jeopardy, and should the Patriots be in panic mode? Jacob, we'll start with you. Um, I would say the Patriots should be in panic mode. They're definitely not going to win their division, I don't think. I think it's the Bills' division to lose. Um, But, yeah, I think that Cam's job is kind of in jeopardy, but if you look at who's behind him, that's why I don't think it's fully in jeopardy yet. Stidham came in after Cam, and he didn't really do anything after Cam was benched anyway, and I don't really know about Brian Hoyer either. So right now I would say Cam's job is slightly in jeopardy, but I wouldn't really overly worry if I'm Cam Newton just because Stidham and Hoyer, I don't know if they can do much of a better job. Brendan. You know, I mean, Belichick even came out yesterday and said that he still plans on starting Newton the rest of the way. Um, and probably because what Jacob said, they don't have, um, good enough starting, I mean, backup quarterbacks to go in there and do the job that Belichick wants them to do, Stidham and Hoyer. Um, you saw both of them 
in that uh, Kansas City game when Newton had to quarantine that week. Um, they didn't. I mean, they that game was right there for New England's taking, and they still couldn't get the job done. Um, I think New England is in New England is in a really weird place right now. Um, I mean, Newton New yesterday nine for fifteen. When you have Cam Newton only throwing fifteen times uh, a game and not being able to get in the end zone, that's not. You can't have that be the case with the Patriots. They're just in a weird spot right now where I don't think the offense is gelling. Um, Belichick's offense is not the way that Newton plays. Um, I don't think – I think we're going to see down the line here this season that that matchup is just not a good fit, Belichick and Newton. Ben? Ben, I think you're <laughs> Ben. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I don't think they should panic quite yet. I think in about a week or two they should probably start panicking once they get to the halfway point of the schedule. Yeah. Uh, I don't think Cam's job's in jeopardy though. He played great to start the year. He's had a rough couple weeks. Had to miss some time because of positive tests. But ultimately, Jared Sim didn't really do much when he came in yesterday. So I think that's going to go a long ways into keeping Cam as the starter. But definitely a weird year, and we're going to really see how good of a coaching staff Bill Belichick has based on how they finish out the rest of the year for sure. And Cam feels, he came out and said that he feels like his job's in jeopardy, so it's going to be interesting to see if that lights a spark under him because he feels that way, and maybe we see uh, an improved Cam here coming in to week eight. Uh, the Patriots, yes, you need to panic. You don't know what to do in this situation because it's been 20-plus years since you've been in this situation. So it's time to buckle down and figure out what needs to be done as you prepare um, going into the rest of the season. I do believe the Patriots yeah, the Patriots have the Bills next week on the road, so that's a, that's a tough matchup for them. Uh, but if you can go into Buffalo against Bills Mafia and steal a win, get back to 3-4, and four, that's a huge win, um, and I think the Patriots realize that they don't want to fall to 2-5 and five and that this game is going to be a big one coming in next Sunday. So now let's take a look through seven weeks, well, 6.9 weeks because we still have Monday Night Football tonight. Um, what the divisions look like, the AFC East, Buffalo's leading it at 5-2, and two, Miami right behind at 3-3, three and three, New England 2-4, and four, and then the Jets 0-7. Oh the dwellers of the AFC East. The AFC North, Pittsburgh 6-0, Baltimore 5-1, Cleveland 5-2, as that's quite the top of a division, if I do say so myself. And then Cincinnati 1-5-1 is the back of that one. AFC South, Tennessee 5-1, Indianapolis 4-2, then Houston and Jacksonville 3-4 and at 1-6. And, and then AFC West, Kansas City leads it at 6-1, Las Vegas in second at 3-3, three three. the Chargers 2-4, and, and then Denver 2-4. And the NFC East, Philadelphia 2-4-1 and one, leads that division. Washington in second at 2-5, and five, Dallas in third at 2-5, and five, and New York in last at 1-6. And, and the NFC East, the Bears 5-1 at the top. Green Bay, who's 5-1 and one, due to tiebreaker, the Bears beat the Packers or have the better division record. Um, but the Bears do play tonight, so when there, we'll give them a half game lead. A loss there, we'll put them behind the Packers. Detroit three and three, Minnesota one and five, NFC South, Tampa Bay's five and two, New Orleans four and two, Carolina three and four, and the Falcons one and six below. Another game yet again. And the NFC West, Seattle five and one, Arizona five and two, Los Angeles four and two, but they also play tonight, so a win can move them up in a tie with Arizona. A loss puts them in a tie for last with San Francisco, who's four and three. Guys, who's your biggest s- surprise at division? Who's which division leaders are the biggest surprise to you right now? Ben, we'll start with you. All right. Looking over these, Seattle doesn't surprise me. Russell Wilson has been playing out of his mind. He's always a great player, and he always carries his team. Tampa Bay. Honestly, I expected New Orleans to do better to start the year. So I'd say ta- Tampa Bay, probably the biggest surprise right now just because – I didn't expect him to start off as hot. I expect him to start pretty slow and then really start gelling and 
firing on all cylinders as we got into, into the back half of the schedule and finished out the year. So I'd say that's probably the biggest surprise for me right now. Brendan? Yeah, I would have to say Chicago um, being at the top of their respective division, the North with Green Bay. Did not think that they – that benching Mr. Trubisky and then bringing in Nick Foles would uh, do wonders for that offense. Um, Montgomery playing out of his mind um, at that running back position. Um, and then they have a – Solid supporting cast with Robinson and Graham. Um, but Nick Foles doing the bulk of the work for them right now. Um, his numbers don't really show it. But being able to lead Chicago to wins is really tough with uh, that division that they're in. So being tied with Green Bay right now is pretty surprising for me. Jacob? Yeah, I'd have to agree with Brendan on this one. It's definitely the Bears for me. Um, like how he said, Mitchell Trubisky, really bad quarterback. I didn't really think Nick Foles was that good to lead the team to leading the division, especially with the Packers and a team that's really surprising me a lot too, like the Vikings. I thought the Vikings were going to be a lot better. Um, but yeah, the Bears, nothing about their offense is really like over the top in my opinion. Their defense is really good. Um, but yeah, I was just expecting the Packers to really kind of run away with this division in a way, and the Bears are kind of disrupting that, so that's definitely my biggest surprise. And we're all, the last two of us, or last three of us, are agreeing, so I have Chicago as well, just because of Green Bay. Um, other than that, everything, all the division leaders are as expected, I believe, Buffalo would be in the front. Another one, Pittsburgh's kind of surprising, I thought Baltimore would be in the front at this point. I did not expect Pittsburgh to start 6-0, but I did not also expect Pittsburgh to be where Cincinnati's at, so I'm not saying that's a surprise because I knew they could do it, but it's surprising in the fact that I thought Baltimore would be ahead of them, uh, which we'll get into their matchup this weekend. Uh, biggest surprise division dweller, so who's at the bottom of the division that surprises you the most? Jacob, we'll start with you. Yeah, I kind of touched on it a little bit when I was talking about the Bears. It's definitely the Vikings for me. Um, Kirk Cousins and Dalvin Cook, I mean, I thought that they would lead them to more success. Dalvin Cook has played good. Obviously, he's been injured, so that's a big bummer for him. Kirk Cousins has just played really bad this year. Uh, the defense hasn't been all that great either. Uh, the Vikings have been in the playoffs the past couple of years, so really just to see them go on this sharp decline really surprises me. Ben? Yeah, I'll agree with Minnesota. I think when you look at that roster coming into the year, at least offensively, they should have been able, got Justin Jefferson in the draft, in the draft uh, they should have been able to do more and they should be winning more than they are. So it's definitely surprising to see them fall so quickly into the cellar of the, N of the NFC North. Brendan? I agree with Minnesota, but um, just to throw out another team, Atlanta. Um, just with the way that they've played in their games, they their offense has played well enough that they should be able to win more than one game. With their lineup that they have, Calvin Ridley, Julia, Julius Jones, Todd Gurley, um, I don't know how they're one and five. I mean, they've we all know that they've lost in every way possible. Um, and this weekend, no different. Um, I mean, their offense just not does not come out to be a one and five team. So, can't believe that they've uh, they're at the bottom of their division. I wrote down two. I agree with you, Brendan. With Atlanta, they were really surprised me being one and like maybe not surprising that they're in last. I thought Carolina would finish fourth, but Teddy Bridgewater really showing out as them a three and four record. But I thought Atlanta would be around the same record as Carolina, if not like a game better at this point. Uh, but another one I had was Houston. Uh, yes, they're considered third place because of the tie-breaking win over Jacksonville. But if you would have told me the Texans would be 1-6 through seven games with Deshaun Watson, um, yeah, they lost Hopkins, but still a decent receiving core. You got Will Fuller, Randall Cobb, 
other guys here and there. And then they also added David Johnson and a defense that's above average. I would have thought you were crazy. But here we are. Houston's 1-6. and six. And, yes, a couple of their games are on the wrong side of a close game. But, nonetheless, they're at the bottom of that division. And they're, I mean, more than four games out of Tennessee for that first place spot. And four games is a lot when you're talking about the NFL, which is only 16 games long. It's a quarter of a season that you need to win and they need to lose. So, uh, Houston really surprised me in that aspect. So, looking into week eight, we have a couple, we have a, a good slate of games going on. I'll go through a few, and I just want to hear your guys' picks on them. So, we'll always touch on Thursday night football. The 1-6 and six Falcons travel to Carolina to take on the 3-4 and four Panthers. Uh, do the Falcons get that second win, or are the Panthers getting back to 500? Ben, we'll start with you. I'm going to take the Panthers. I think they're a better team this year. Certainly luckier. I mean, the Falcons couldn't even fall correctly before the goal line. They couldn't even get that to go their way. That was pretty funny to see the Lions players celebrating a Todd Gurley touchdown when he failed to fall before the goal line so they could continue to run the clock. But I just think I just think Carolina's rolling better this year. I think they're going to get the win in prime time. Brendan? Um, gonna be a tough game, but I'm I'm going with Atlanta. I don't see them going one and seven. Uh, I think they can get that second win. Jacob, I mean, I really want to pick Atlanta, but I agree with Ben. I've just never seen an unluckier football team in my life. I'm gonna pick the Panthers here just because of Teddy Bridgewater's good play and just because Atlanta has terrible luck. And I'm gonna go. Panthers in this one as well because CMC practiced today, so if he's back, they're going to be even harder to beat. And uh, the Falcons just are going to find a way to lose. Uh, new coach now that they fired Dan Quinn a couple weeks ago, so still struggling that aspect. Next one, Raiders-Browns. Raiders coming in at 3-3. Three and three. Browns coming in at 5-2. and two. The Browns will be the host of this one. Jacob, we'll start with you. Do the Browns go into the bye week at 6-2, and two, or do the Raiders get back over 500? I think the Browns do go in at 6-2 and two to the bye week. Um, I definitely think it's going to be a pretty big battle. I think it's going to be a really close game. But in the end, I think that Baker actually is going to have another good game. Throwing to his little targets like Harrison Bryant. Hopefully, Austin Hooper will be back. I want to see how he does with Jarvis and Donovan Peoples-Jones and guys like that. But I definitely think the Browns are going to beat the Raiders this week. Brendan. I'll go with Cleveland. Um, probably going to be a high-scoring game with uh, the way that the Browns' defense has played. Maybe this is one of their games where they force three or four turnovers that they've uh, done before. Um, but yeah, I think Baker continues that uh, momentum from this past Sunday, and uh, they go six and two into the bye week, which is probably their best record going into the bye week in our lifetime. So, Ben. Uh, I'm going to agree with Jacob and Brent. I'm going to take the Browns. I think it's going to be really close, probably a field goal or a touchdown game either way. But I think the Browns can get this win today, win on uh, Sunday, because I don't think Vegas is in that that air of teams like Pittsburgh and Baltimore where they're great. I think they're a good team, but they're not in that sort of tier. So I think they should be able to win this game and head to the bye with a win. I think it's Browns as well, but I think both teams are in their 30s. I think it's a shootout as far as NFL aspect goes. Um, we've seen the Raiders score a lot of points this year against teams like the Chiefs and such. Browns' defense is, once you get further back, it gets worse. And for the Browns, the Raiders have obviously showed holes. The Browns have a potent offense, and uh, – Baker's trying to prove what he's worth, and if we're all right about the Odell scenario where Odell may have been holding him back a bit, this should be a game where he proves that. And I say the Browns do get 6-2 and two into the bye week, so now we'll go to a later game. This might be the game of the week. Chiefs-Jets, guys. 6-1 and one Chiefs host the 0-7 Jets. Just kidding, this isn't the game of the week, but are we all in agreement to Chiefs win? Just everybody turn on their mics and say yes. Yes, sir. Yep, awesome. Yes. All right, so now we'll look at the real what might – I would say is the game of the week. 
Six and zero Pittsburgh heads to Baltimore for a matchup with the five and one Ravens. Brendan, we'll start with you. Steelers or Ravens? Who's winning and who's going to have first place at the end of Week Eight? Well, the last time that Baltimore was in uh, that primetime game, the game of the week against Kansas City, a kind of a uh, big disappointment um, to say nicely. Um, so. Here they are again against their divisional rival, who's undefeated. Um, I'll go with Pittsburgh, um, I, but I think Lamar Jackson uh, will give the Ravens a chance to win. Um, might come down to the wire, but it also has uh, a making for kind of a, uh, a blowout win by Pittsburgh. So I will go with the Steelers. Ben. I uh, agree with Brendan. I'm going to go with the Steelers to win. I think defensively that will give them an edge. Lamar Jackson should be able to keep his team in there down to the wire. I don't think it's a blowout either way. I think it's going to be like the Browns game. I think it's going to be probably a field goal or a touchdown and definitely going to be coming down the wire. But I'll take I'll take the Steelers by a field goal or a touchdown. Jacob? Yeah, I think Lamar is definitely going to keep the Ravens in the game, but ultimately I think the Steelers' defense is going to slow him down just enough in order to get the win. I'm expecting Big Ben to have a bounce-back week, and like I said, that defense is going to slow down the Ravens a little bit to win a close game. And I agree, it's going to come down to defense, and I think the Steelers have the advantage there, and especially run defense so they can hold guys like Lamar or running backs like Mark Ingram, Gus Edwards, or J.K. Dobbins. Um, and I think the secondary is good enough to hold down the Ravens in general. So I go Steelers as well, getting to 7-0 and holding on to the AFC North for at least two more weeks because at that point they'd be two games ahead. Um, now, next one we're going to look at, it's another battle for first place, guys. 2-5 and five Cowboys at the 2-4-1 and one Eagles. Winner takes over first place. I know that's sad to say. Jacob, we'll start with you. I mean, we don't even know who's going to be the quarterback for the Cowboys right now, so I'm definitely going to pick the Eagles in this one. I think it's going to be just a pathetic football game myself, but I think the Eagles in the end will win because they have more healthy bodies, even though the Eagles in their own right are not healthy at all. They have more healthy bodies. They're going to end up beating the Cowboys. Brendan? Yeah, I'll go with the Eagles. Um, it has a chance to be a blowout win, actually. Um, wouldn't be surprised if Philadelphia runs away with this. The Cowboys are just so mismanaged. They're dumpster fire. Um, I can't see them making it a game. So, Eagles. Ben? Ben? Now, fly, Eagles, fly, I think. They're healthier. Carson Wentz has picked up his level of play in the last week or so. And like Brendan said, Dallas is an absolute dumpster fire, so I'll take the Eagles by two scores. By two scores. I'm going to go Eagles as well um, for the same reasons. I mean, Dallas is a lot to figure out. Quarterback, coach, um, it's just not looking good. And the Eagles, when healthy, definitely the best team that NFC East. So that is it for NFL talk. Um, again, Bears Rams going at going at it tonight here, starting soon. Um, we'll have this podcast uploaded probably around halftime of that game on Studio M. But now we're going to jump into college football, which is all done for this week, and we're going to go in order of rankings, talking about big games that happen this week. So we'll start with number one, Clemson. They take down Syracuse forty-seven to twenty-one. They improved to six and zero and now have an average score of forty eight to fourteen. Are they the best team in football? If not, who on their schedule can beat them? Brendan, we'll start with you. Yeah, they're definitely in the best team in football right now. Um, Trevor Lawrence is playing out of his mind. Um, Dabo Sweeney has that offense firing firing on all cylinders. Surprisingly, they only put up forty seven against uh, Syracuse. I mean, this team has the ability to put up 60 and 70 week in and week out. I don't see a team um, being able to beat them. Now, 
yeah, we've got two weeks until they face off with um, currently number three, Notre Dame. Um, but even then, we've seen Notre Dame lose to Clemson um, in the big-time games before. Uh, that monsoon uh, at Clemson a few years back, a couple of years ago in the playoff, they don't show up. Um, but Clemson, talking about them specifically, I they might run the table this year. Um, if they get into the playoff against a team, I mean, they will be in the playoff. But if they play Ohio State or Alabama in the playoff, they should win that game easily. I don't. I love watching Trevor Lawrence right now. Um, they're just they're just way too good. They're on another level. Ben. Yeah, I think they're the best team in college football right now. Let me look at their schedule. They've got Boston College, which they're favored by 31 points, so that's a win. Florida State, they're going to win that. Pittsburgh, Virginia Tech, and then in two weeks they've got Notre Dame. That's probably the only game where they might not win on their schedule. And even then they're favored by 14.5 points. And the ESPN, FBI, gives them a 69.8% chance to win. So I think it's very likely they run the table through the ACC schedule and go into the playoffs undefeated and honestly probably go unbeaten the whole way and win it all. I think Ohio State's the only team in the country that has a chance of really stopping them because of just how talented that Buckeye, this Buckeye squad is with Justin Fields and Sean Wade over on the defensive end. But even then, honestly, it's going to be a tough task for Ohio State to be able to try and beat them. Jacob? Yeah, they're the best team in football right now. Um, Trevor Lawrence has played great, but even in this game, I mean, he threw a pick six, and they still dominated um, Syracuse. And I think that they are definitely going to win out in the ACC. Ohio State and Alabama could possibly challenge them in the playoff, but I don't see that happening either. Honestly, I don't, I don't really see anybody beating Clemson right now. I think Clemson's on their way to an undefeated season and a national championship. I agree with all you. I believe they're the best team in football right now. And the worst rec- regular season record, they get 10-1. and one. Notre Dame is the only team on their schedule that has a chance. And like Ben said, it's still a 14-point favorite for Clemson. I think I agree. I, I believe they win the national championship this year. Um, so moving on to number two, Alabama. They defeat Tennessee 48-17. to But they also lose Jalen Waddell for the season with an ankle injury. They are now 5-0. and But how big of a loss is Jalen Waddell? Jacob. Um, I think he's definitely a significant loss, but I still think they're going to function pretty well. Mac Jones is playing really good at quarterback. He's actually my pick at the moment for the Heisman Trophy. Um, and he still has weapons with him, like Najee Harris and Devontae Smith. So I still think that Alabama's offense is going to run properly, especially with Jones at the quarterback. But Waddle definitely is a significant loss for the team. Brendan? Yeah, I mean, he's a big loss. He's He was playing really well up until um, the game against Tennessee. But I agree with uh, Jacob. I like Mac Jones. Uh, John Mechie, uh, Michi, I think that's how you say. He's been um, – I mean, he'll fill that role nicely. Um, they've got it pretty easy the rest of the way. Uh, Mississippi State, LSU, uh, Kentucky, Auburn, Arkansas. They'll run the table, I think easily um but it's definitely definitely sucks for them waddle was playing really well to, enough to get a uh, first round pick uh, next year so i don't think it really deteriorates their offense though ben i think it'll be a loss for him but i don't think it's gonna hurt him that bad i mean it's alabama they're talented they're well coached and Mac Jones has been dealing under center for them. I mean, looking at the rest of the schedule, even with Waddle now out, and every single remaining game in the regular season for them in the SEC, they're not favored by less than 80-something percent. So I think they're going to easily just run the table through there, probably dominating the SEC championship game. And I think they're like Clemson. They're going to go undefeated and head into the playoffs undefeated. But I don't think they're on the same tier as Clemson, though. Yeah, it's a huge loss, but you look at Alabama's wide receiver room, Devontae Smith, 
and other guys filling in a the room. There's not a lot of college teams that can say they have that kind of depth at the receiver. Devontae Smith is – I mean, I, I never believed Alabama had a one. I believe they had two ones. Um, and now just the one gets to shine. But I agree. I think with Ben – I agree with Ben. I think Bama, they have, they get to undefeated. I mean, LSU and Auburn is probably the two best games they have left just because the rivalry that's there. But then again, LSU and Auburn have both been – significantly worse than expected this season. So I don't think Alabama has any problems going undefeated. Now, looking at number three, Notre Dame. They hold Pitt to 162 total yards and win 45-3. to three. Uh, They improved to 5-0, and oh, and their defense continues to shine, only allowing 273 yards per game, which amongst the teams that have played more than one game, that ranks third. And they've allowed 9.8 points per game, which if you include all the teams that have played one game, that still ranks sixth. If you don't count those teams that have only played one week, that ranks second behind Marshall. Uh, is Notre Dame's defense good enough to carry them to an undefeated season or a playoff run? Yes or no, Jacob? Um, I think it's good enough to carry them to a 10-1 and one run, personally. I think that they can kind of stop. Clemson's offense a little bit, but they're definitely not going to stop it all the way, and I think Clemson's going to ultimately beat them, so 10-1. and one. Brendan? Yeah, and they've been playing really good um, right now to this point. I mean, they were the only reason that they beat Louisville because uh, Ian Book decided not to show up against Louisville. Um, but you look at their defensive line, Dalen Hayes, Amosa Tagovailoa, um, Ogun DJ, um, if they can put pressure against Trevor Lawrence when they do play Clemson, um, that that will be really important. Their secondary of uh, McLeod, Hamilton, um, Tariq Bracy, um, they're pretty special. Um, Houston Griffith, Sean Crawford as well, um, and they're, that's they're going to be the only reason that Notre Dame has a chance against Clemson. Um, they really have to show up on that day um, when we talk about that game later on but in the coming weeks. But, I mean, a playoff run, maybe. But we'll see when they play Clemson. But their defense is special enough. Ben? Uh, I think defensively they're really good. Um, Ian Book, if he decides to show up that week, he can be really good for them offensively. Uh, I think they go 10-2 and two through the regular season, the ACC title game. I think they're going to lose to Clemson in the regular season, and they're going to lose to Clemson again in the ACC championship game. And it might be good enough to carry them into the four seed in the playoffs, but they're going to go one and done almost certainly, so probably 10-3 and three overall on the year, which isn't terrible. I think if they lose twice, they're not in the playoffs, but – it's going to be weird to see because a lot of a lot of these conferences are beating up on each other. So uh, maybe it does. Um, moving on to number five, Ohio State. They start their season with a huge win over Nebraska, fifty-two to seventeen. Justin Fields is near perfect, going twenty of twenty-one for two hundred seventy-six yards and two touchdowns, while adding fifty-four yards and a touchdown on the ground as well. Guys, is Justin Fields the best quarterback in football, or is it Trevor Lawrence? And who? of the remaining seven games on their regular season set schedule can beat Ohio State. Ben, we'll start with you. Uh, I think it's close between him and Trevor Lawrence. I mean, as an OSU fan, I want to say Justin Fields, but I know like deep down I think Trevor Lawrence is a little bit better. I think it's just a little bit. I think it's pretty close, though. I don't, I don't think the gap between those two is – as big as you might think. I think it's pretty close. Pretty close. They're both going to be top draft picks. I think Lawrence is probably going to go number one because he's slightly better. But, I mean, looking over the Buckeyes' remaining schedule here, they got Penn State next week. Penn State got upset by Indiana. I don't think Buckeyes are going to have much trouble there. They're going to win by probably two scores. Rutgers shocked Michigan State, but Michigan State's not good. Uh, their first year under a new head coach. Buckeyes are going to win by a couple scores. Maryland is bad. That's a couple score win. Indiana might be able to push us. They have been able to push us in the last couple years when we've played for at least a little bit, but they're still going to probably win by two scores, two or three scores when it's all said and done, probably three. Illinois, they're going to win by four or five touchdowns. Michigan State, that's a five-touchdown win. 
And then Michigan, Michigan might be the one team that can beat Ohio State in the regular season in the Big Ten. Uh, they dominated Minnesota over the weekend to open their season up strong. So I think Michigan is probably the only team that can beat Ohio State. And even then, ESPN gives the Buckeyes an 87% chance to win that game. So we'll see how Michigan's doing when we finally get to that game on December 12th. But I think the Buckeyes are probably going unbeaten. Brennan. Yeah, so one game, um, small sample size of Justin Fields this year so far. Um, let's not get carried away. Um, but I don't, after that performance against Nebraska, I don't see how he can play any worse. Um, right now, I do think Trevor Lawrence is better than Fields, but yeah, I don't think, I don't know how he can play any worse against the schedule that they have. Um, I think they've got the most laughable schedule. In all of college football, um, the teams that they play are a good example of how the Big Ten is possibly one of the worst um, conferences in college football. They'll run the table, get a good seed in the playoff, um, just like every other year. So I do like Justin Fields. I, just, I think Trevor Lawrence is better right now, though. Jacob. Yeah, I agree with Brendan. Um, one game's not enough to say he's the best quarterback in college football right now. That would be disrespect to Trevor Lawrence and even a guy like Mac Jones. Um, I, I don't see Ohio State really losing to anybody. I think they're going to beat the team up north like how they always do. It just It's almost just a given now. Um, I think Indiana is an interesting game, though. I like that Ben pointed that out. That could be a trap game. They might overlook Indiana. Indiana could sneak up and potentially beat them. But really, I think Ohio State's going to run the table in the Big Ten and make the playoff. No, I agree with you guys. I think it's Trevor Lawrence right now. Um, but definitely a great week one and uh, definitely a great quarterback. But looking at their schedule, obviously Penn State has a chance this weekend. Uh, that could have been a fluke game against Indiana. And the fact that Penn State is home, I mean, playing in that stadium is never easy. Um, but I still think Ohio State will end up getting it. Um, this year, you, it's no fans. It's, it's no, no, in Pennsylvania, I'm pretty sure they have, like, smaller section. Like, they're allowed to have some fans. It's not the same. It's not a sold out, white yeah, out. But, I mean, it's going to, it's, it's hostile territory. I mean, Penn State's going to find a way. They're not winning that game. Penn they're State's going to find a way to make that environment in their favor. That's what environment? Like this, through sound and video, Brendan. It's going to be like 5,000 oh. fans there. Oh, it's, yeah. That, calm that down. Pumped in crowd noise will affect Justin yeah. Fields. Yeah, oh, Buckeyes yeah. are going to be focused this early in the season. They're not going to let Penn State beat them this week. But I'm telling you guys now, it is 2020. They had to wait four weeks and watch everyone else play. They're, they're pissed off. It's 2020. The craziest year ever. I don't know if Michigan's a given. I think they could end the streak this year. Michigan looked good oh, oh. against no. Minnesota. No. And I can't wait for that game because I think it's going to be a very, very competitive game. And I think it's going to spark. I think it's going to look like a lot of games that you saw in the past that really started the rivalry. And uh, I guess we'll see who ends out on top. But obviously there's a lot of football left if Michigan's week one was a fluke as well. You never know. Now moving on, we talked about Penn State. They fall to Indiana 36-35. Uh, Indiana goes for two points in overtime and converts to take down the Nittany Lions. What does this loss mean for Penn State in the eight-game season? Jacob, we'll start with you. I mean, it means they have to be perfect the rest of the way in order to have any shot at the playoffs. Um, like how we just said, I don't think they're beating Ohio State, so I don't think they're really going to be perfect. It really messed up their plans for a playoff year. Um, but I do think that Penn State's still not as bad as we're going to make them out to be just because they lost to Indiana. Indiana just played a really good game. Penn State's definitely probably like a 15 to 20 range team, would I would say. They're definitely not an eight, like the eighth best team. But they'll probably put up somewhat of a fight against Ohio State, but they're definitely not going to win this week. Ben. 
I think Penn State season is basically over. I mean, they're going to have to go perfect, somehow upset Ohio State, or pray that Michigan can do it to have any shot at maybe slipping into the Big Ten title game and having a chance to play their way into the playoff. But I think they're going to lose to the Buckeyes this week at home, and I think that's going to kill their their season altogether. I mean, they might go 6-2, and two, but that's not going to get them in the Big Ten title game, and that's not going to get them in the playoff. This is not a year to miss out on your conference championship game because there's absolutely no chance in hell that you're going to make it in without winning your conference or having a close loss in the title game to get that four seed. Brendan. Yeah, that that Indiana game, worst way that you could start off a season. You score too early uh, in the final minutes and give Indiana a chance to force overtime, and then you lose in overtime. Um, I don't, I don't know how James Franklin rallies the troops this coming week. Um, that's just a devastating blow to um the chemistry of that locker room. Just not not the season, not their season. Um, I do think that they run the table after Ohio State. Um, but even you saw Rutgers somehow won this past weekend. Michigan isn't. Uh, a gimme. So, who knows with this team? It might be a really bad year for the Nittany Lions. Yeah, and I have here written down playoff chances are zero percent because I don't think they're beating Ohio State. So, two lost Penn State, they're done. Moving on, number nine Cincinnati. How about them Bearcats? As they use a strong second half to beat number sixteen SMU forty-two to thirteen. Cincinnati stays undefeated at four and zero. SMU, who was five and zero, falls to five and one. Is Cincinnati a serious contender from the American Conference, or is it just them beating up on easy easy teams? Jacob, we'll start with you. I do think they're a serious contender, because like how we've said, these other big conferences are really beating up on each other, and this is such a crazy year for college football. If Cincinnati really runs the table and wins their conference, and they're ranked so high right now, they have the potential to make the playoff. So I definitely think... If any year that a team from a smaller conference could make it, it's definitely this year. Brendan. I, I, I like the positivity um, to think that the Bearcats are a contender, but you got to look at their schedule. Austin P. That's is that how you say it? Army, South Florida, um, they got Memphis coming up this week. Memphis is a good team. Um, so they, may, they may even lose to them. But I don't think if they do run the table, you're going to look at their schedule compared to Clemson, Alabama, Ohio, Ohio State. I know we've said that Ohio State has a really weak schedule, but the talent level is so different there. Um, I don't think that – I mean, you're going to have a similar case like you had with UCF a few years back. Um their, their conference brings them down. They're not going to be able to make the playoff. And I agree. I would say they are a contender for sure, but not serious. Because how would they even – you, you got to think about how the matchups – they're, they're going to think about viewership and ratings. I mean, what's a Cincinnati Clemson round one? Nobody's going to want that bloodbath. Um, how do they stack up against teams like Clemson, Alabama, Ohio State, Notre Dame, Georgia, etc.? I, and that's what I think is going to be the deciding factor in them getting held out. Um, but we'll see. Maybe well, well, they do go undefeated this year and finish maybe top six. You're gonna you're gonna have the teams from those kind of conferences like UCF, uh, you know, the Mountain West and AAC at the door of the football playoff committee. Yeah, for sure. Fighting. Yeah. For eight or sixteen, an extended playoff, an eight-game, yeah. eighteen playoff. That's that. Yeah, that's personally why I think they're a serious contender because I just think it's horrible for the playoff committee. Say, like a team like Georgia potentially could have two losses. Obviously, Georgia's probably more talented than Cincinnati, but how can you look at a Cincinnati team that's undefeated and has been highly ranked all year and not say that they make the playoff? I mean, I definitely see where you guys are coming from. Nobody wants to see Cincinnati in the playoff, but I mean, if you're undefeated and you have a better record than some of these other guys, why shouldn't you get a shot? I think it shows that like maybe they should make the playoff potentially like eight teams instead of the four-team format. 
and they're getting punished for being in. I mean, they can only play the new teams that they're on are on their exactly. schedule. Exactly. You can't do exactly. anything, especially this year. You couldn't schedule a lot of conference opponents. Exactly. So, I mean, yeah, it's they're getting punished for going undefeated, basically. Mm-hmm. Here's exactly. another thing. It all depends on the eye test as well. They're not going to let in Cincinnati if they're squeaking past Memphis, Houston, and Central Florida. This win this week, beating an undefeated SMU team, 42-13, to that's huge for the eye test because you're not going to get this many opportunities to play a team of that caliber in the American Conference. And them doing, them getting a 29-point victory in a 28 nothing second half is it's going to give them a few little jolts. I mean, they already bumped up to number seven in the AP pool. So they're, they're already there. If there was an 18 playoff, they'd already be considered in it. So this win, definitely a big one for Cincinnati. If they do win out, they'll need more of those kinds of wins against teams like Memphis, Houston, UCF. You're supposed to do this to teams like Tulsa and Austin, Pierre, however you say it. But it's when you do it to the teams like Memphis, Houston, Central Florida, and like SMU, that's going to get you on the radars of the college football playoff committee. Now, our last game we're going to talk about, last game to highlight, number 18, Michigan dominates, number 21, Minnesota, 49-24. to 24. Jim Harbaugh does not wear khakis, and Michigan looks like a powerhouse. Uh, how big is this win for the Wolverines? Brendan. It's a good win to start out, start out the year. Um, you're going to have to go undefeated into that Ohio State game to really bring the program back on the radar. Um, Some that they've kind of failed to do in the past few years. They've been close um, with that big win over Notre Dame. Um, but I think that's the last big win that they've had. Mm-hmm. So um, this is the year at some point you're going to have to go on and feed it into Ohio State and, and beat Ohio State. The only way that you do that is to go on and feed it into it with a lot of momentum. Um, potentially, I, th- I mean, I think that game is still at noon, but – you got to be able to bring the program to where you're playing the, your rival in your conference and make it a Saturday night primetime game or college game day. Is that your uh, game? I mean, that's the only way that Michigan gets back on, on the same playing field as uh, the other top programs. So good win. We'll start, start out the year, but long way to go. Jacob. Yeah, I agree with Brendan. Um, it's a good win, but we've seen it before. They pile up good wins, and then they lay an egg against a big-time team like the Buckeyes. I mean, they really just need to win out. They need to prove that they are back on the map by beating the Buckeyes. This is definitely a good start to it. You definitely have to build on it leading up to the Buckeyes, but really their main test this year is going to be the Buckeyes. If you don't beat Ohio State, you're still not going to be considered that you're fully back as a great Michigan football team. So it's a good start, but you still need to prove yourself. Yeah, I agree. It's a great start. Huge statement when we look at it. Khaki, Jim Harbaugh is 1-7 against top 25 teams, I think I saw earlier. Now he's 1-0 in these blue pants against top 25 teams. So that's a pretty good winning percentage if you ask me. But uh, Minnesota, a really good team last year. They did lose Antoine Winfield. um, So maybe they're not the same team. But nonetheless, you got to take that as a huge win for Michigan. And it's going to be a huge bit of confidence going forward for the Wolverines. Now looking at the AP pool, the top 25, it does see some changes throughout. Um, you see some movement going on as Ohio State jumps from 5 to 3. Um, Notre Dame and Georgia both fall back one because of that. Wisconsin jumps five spots to 9. Uh, Michigan jumps five spots to 13. Um, and then Indiana, Oklahoma, Boise State all enter the discussion as Virginia Tech, Minnesota, and NC State all fall out. Guys, what is your biggest surprise thus far in the AP pool, Brendan? Um, biggest surprise uh, would definitely be having Cincinnati that high at number seven. Um, good to see a team like Coastal Carolina in there. I forget. I don't even know what conference they're from. Um, but, I mean, that's probably as high as they're going to go. Same with Marshall being in the top 25. But that's just because we've only had one week in Big Ten. Um, so, yeah, I would say biggest surprise for me is having uh, Oklahoma State and Cincinnati as high as they are. Um, Oklahoma State going to get tested really big this coming week against Texas. So, Jacob? 
I'm pretty sure Coastal Carolina is Sun Belt, but I could be very wrong on that. I'm the same oh. way as you. Right. Um, but my biggest surprise, personally, I still can't get over this. I know it's been a few weeks now. It's the fact that Oklahoma's 24th. I really was not expecting Oklahoma to be this bad this year. With a guy like Lincoln Riley at the helm and really a dynamic quarterback like Spencer Rattler, I really expected Oklahoma to be playing better than they are right now. And like how Brendan said, it's nice to see a team like Cincinnati up there at seven. That's probably another good surprise. But for me personally, it's just how bad Oklahoma has played and the fact that they're ranked so low. So my biggest don't watch, don't watch um, QB one Beyond the Lights on Netflix. They followed Spencer Rattler's senior year when he was uh, I forget when he was in high school. I forget what high school it was, but uh, he he was this kind of cocky, arrogant. It's all about him, quarterback, and it exposed them. And I think that's hurting him uh, right now at Oklahoma. He's not. I mean, he got benched against Texas. Yeah, they came. He he came back in the game and won, but he just. I don't think he's what Lincoln Riley really expected. I don't think he's going to be able to join that long list of really good quarterbacks. Oklahoma that Lincoln Riley's coached. Yeah, I think it was the hype for me personally because, like I said, you had you just came off of Baker Mayfield, Kyler Murray, and Jalen Hurts. I definitely expected Spencer Rattler to perform just a little bit better just because of Lincoln Riley. But yeah, he's young. Hopefully, he can get a little bit better, but still. Big surprise to me. Yeah, I agree. Marshall and Coastal Carolina, surprising to see in there. Uh, BYU 6-0 and number 11. Uh, when's the last time we saw the Cougars that high up and undefeated this late into the season? Um, Cincinnati, Oklahoma State, new faces in the top 10. Uh, I'd say a big surprise for me is Ohio State jumping up to three after just one game, especially with that one game being Nebraska. Um, I could see maybe them jumping up to four with a game like that just because Georgia has a loss. Um, but you put them ahead of a 5 no Notre Dame team that just got off a 45-3 to victory over Pitt. And uh, if you had to argue, I'd say Pitt's better than Nebraska. But nonetheless, there's four playoff spots, so all four of those guys still in there, except for obviously Georgia. Just a little surprising to see a 1-0 team getting that kind of jump. Um, now, guys, looking at these rankings, looking at records and such, um, if the playoffs were to start next weekend, Who's your very early college football playoff bracket right now? Jacob, we'll start with you. So, top team for me is obviously Clemson. I'm going to put Alabama at two. I think Ohio State can ultimately win the Big Ten. I'm going to put them at three just because of their shortened schedule. And four, I know that you guys are probably going to disagree with me on this because I said they were a serious contender, but I'm putting Cincinnati in there right now because I think they're going to win out. I think these other teams are just going to keep beating up on each other. And it's just the hopefulness in me. I totally understand what you guys are saying. Like Nobody's going to want to see Cincinnati in there, but I'm just hopeful that they'll put an undefeated team in the playoffs. Even though they might not be the best team, like the better team than, a, say, a Georgia or Notre Dame, just hopefully maybe they will put one of those teams in there. Who's your first two out right now? Uh, my first two out would be Georgia and Notre Dame. Okay. Not in any particular order. It's just those two teams. Personally, I think Oklahoma State's going to start to fall off. I have them losing to Texas this week. And I ultimately think Kansas State's going to end up beating them in the long run, too. So I don't think anybody from the Big 12 is going to get in. But, yeah, I would say it's Georgia and Notre Dame for me right now. Brendan. Jacob, I like the optimism and hoping that Cincinnati gets in. I would love to see a team like them get in as well. Um, but as for the sake of being realistic here, um, I'll go Clemson 1, Alabama 2. Um, nope, sorry, Clemson won Ohio State too. I have Ohio State being number two this year. Um, and then Alabama three, and then Georgia number four. Just, we, we've seen in the past the bias towards the SEC from the playoff committee. Um, I think Georgia gives, I mean, I, th I think you saw the way Georgia can play against Alabama. Um, it's not like they got blown out. Um, so I think they run the table and sneak their way into that four spot. My let my first two out will be uh Notre Dame, and then I think Cincinnati stays alive enough to be one of those first two out. So uh, here's mine: one Alabama, two Ohio State, three Clemson, four Notre Dame. And the first two out, Georgia and Cincinnati. 
I think Cincinnati goes undefeated, stays in that range. I uh, think Georgia, they're just on the brink of being out because this is what I see happening. And I don't know why I feel this way so strongly. I feel like Notre Dame shows up well in the regular season game because the, the, it's not as big of a game as like a, call, a conference championship. Defense plays really well at home. They get the win over Clemson. Then they get that rematch, and Clemson takes advantage, and that's why they both get in if they both have one loss. Now, if Clemson sweeps, Clemson's number one. And I say Bama 2, or Bama Ohio State 2-3. It doesn't really matter. They'll be playing each other. And 4, uh, that's when you throw a curveball in my rankings because I, I agree. I feel like an undefeated Cincinnati could be put in there. But who wants to see Cincinnati? Clemson. So that's where 4 gets really dis- difficult. And that's where it was last year, too. Um, you knew whoever was going to play LSU in the first round was going to get absolutely annihilated, and that's what we saw with Oklahoma. Um, that gap from three to four is just – so it's going to be interesting. So you think, you think a two-loss Notre Dame gets in? Well, that's what I said. If Notre Dame beats Clemson in the regular season and then loses to Clemson in the conference championship, they both get in. Because, okay. right. I mean, there, there's no doubt in my mind that those two are the conference championship because one's going to be undefeated and one's going to have one loss. They're going to play twice this year. Because North Carolina already has that one loss. They still play Notre Dame. I think Notre Dame beats them, so there's two losses. And then at that point, everybody would be two losses or more. So, looking at week nine now, we have Boston College at number one, Clemson. Mississippi State at number two, Alabama. Number three, Ohio State travels to number 18, Penn State. Number four, Notre Dame at Georgia Tech. Number five, Georgia at Kentucky. Texas at number six, Oklahoma State. Memphis at number seven, Cincinnati. Arkansas at number eight, Texas A&M. Number nine, Wisconsin heads to Nebraska. Missouri travels to take on number 10, Florida, and Gainesville. Western Kentucky at number 11, BYU. Michigan State at number 13, Michigan for the Michigan rivalry. Number 15, North Carolina at Virginia. Number 16, Kansas State at West Virginia. Number 17, Indiana at Rutgers. Number 19, Marshall at FIU. Number 20, Coastal Carolina at Georgia State. Navy at number 22, SMU. Number 23, Iowa State at Kansas. Number 24, Oklahoma at Texas Tech. And number 25, Boise State at Air Force. So, guys, I'll start this one. Upset specials. I think Oklahoma State's going to be on upset alert against Texas. I think Ohio State can be on upset alert if Penn State did play a flute game against Indiana. And I also think if K.J. Costella can bring what he brought in week one against LSU, Alabama could at some point be on upset alert. But out of those three, I think Oklahoma State's the one to take to the bank. Jacob, what are your upset specials for this week? Um, yeah, I agree. I think Oklahoma State's definitely going to lose this week. Um, but yeah, looking at the rest of this, it's kind of hard to pick one. I would say potentially Missouri could give Florida a run for their money. They have a high-powered offense. They can potentially challenge the Gators. The Gators' secondary isn't necessarily the greatest. But yeah, for sure, I think Texas. This is going to end up beating Oklahoma State. Missouri has a shot against Florida, but other than that, I don't really see many upsets happening this week. Brendan? Yeah, I like Memphis at number seven, Cincinnati. Memphis has played really well this year. Um, they played of course uh, it was UCF down to the wire. Um, they're 3-1 and one against a good Cincinnati 4-0 team. Uh, potential upset there. Um and if you really want to consider it an upset, Rutgers, I mean, number 17, Indiana at Rutgers, <laughs> they both somehow pulled off miracle wins this past week. Um, Rutgers winning there technically would be an upset, um, but I don't really see um, any opportunities for upsets uh, the rest of the way there. If Rutgers starts to know the world's ending. <laughs> Brendan, I think we're also learning that you're on uh, Cincinnati's. You're against Cincinnati in all ways. Uh, what did I Jacob a couple minutes ago? I love to see him in the playoff. I know, but you're, little, you're but picking them on that. upset alert immediately after saying that. <laughs> because he's playing good enough this team. <laughs> all right, guys, ga- game of the week. Of I want to say that. <laughs> Who's your game of the week, Brendan? My game of the week. Um, Probably Texas at number six, Oklahoma State. Okay. Uh, Texas played really well against Oklahoma. Can they play really well against the other Oklahoma State team? Probably. 
So, well, I mean, this game will really determine what kind of team Oklahoma State is. So, looking forward to it. Jacob? Um, for me, it's just because it's the rivalry. It's Ohio State and Penn State. In my opinion, in more recent years, this rivalry has been better than Ohio State-Michigan in a few ways just because of the closeness and the back and forth. I still think Ohio State's also really going to end up winning this game, but I definitely think it's going to be a close game just because it's Penn State. It always seems to be a close game between these two, so I think that's the game of the week. I'm going to go Michigan State at Michigan. Um, I think this is another big game for Michigan. Um, yeah, Michigan State had a rough week one against Rutgers, seven turnovers, and they're not what they used to be. They have a first-year head coach, but we know darn well that first-year head coach doesn't want to start 0-2. He's going to bring whatever he can against his rival, and I think this is a big game for Harbaugh and the new quarterback in Milton, who, yeah, he had a great week one, but you got to keep that going. You got to get to 7 and 0 against before you play Ohio State, or that game does not matter. And so I, I, I'm looking, yes, it might be a blowout, and that's not what you want to see in a game of the week, but I'm just looking to see what Michigan can do after a statement win against Minnesota if it was just all hype, or if they can carry it into a win against a rival. So that will be it for college football talk, and that will take us to our last sport we're going to talk about, um, the MLB. So we're in the World Series. Game 1, Dodgers take 8-3. Game 2, Rays fight back, get 6-4 win. Game 3, the Dodgers win 6-2. Game 4, the Rays win 8-7, which is by far the best game of the series thus far. And then Game 5, last night, the Dodgers beat the Rays 4-2. The Dodgers have a 3-2 lead right now. Game 6 will be tomorrow night at 8.08 p.m. And Game 7 will be Wednesday at 8.09 if needed. Guys, your thoughts on this series so far? Jacob, I'll start with you. Uh, I think this series should personally be over right now. The Dodgers were a little league play away from really winning the series already, I think. I mean, I just still find that last sequence in um, Game 4 just incredible that the Dodgers blew it in that way. But... I think this series has really been more entertaining than I thought it would be. Heroes like Brandon Lau and Brett Phillips really helped the Rays win those uh, two games. But I think that the Dodgers' talent is too much in the end. The Dodgers are going to end up winning the series, and I really think they should have already won the series. Brendan? Yeah, I mean, I didn't think Tim Bay had much of a shot going into this series before it started. The Rays... I mean, talk about having luck on your side, um, being able to win two games so far. Um, that first win for Tampa Bay, being able to come back um, and use their use their big bats in their lineup to win that one. And then, I mean, talk about being able to have a miracle. I mean, if Chris Taylor doesn't fumble that ball in shallow right center, a Rosarena doesn't score. So, um I mean, they've really been able to luck out so far this year. I mean, this series. Now, do they win game six? It's going to be a – they got Blake Snell, <clears throat> Snell, so that definitely helps. But he's 2-2 two and two so far this postseason. Uh, <clears throat> um, Dodgers, Tony Gonsolin hasn't had a great postseason either. So I think it's going to be every, like every other game this series. Every game. So far, this series, except the first one, has really been closely contested. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But it comes down to the bats. Mm-hmm. You don't win yeah. with good pitching in the postseason. I said that forever. You need heavy hitters. You need to be able to hit the home run in the postseason to be able to win. The Dodgers can do that. Not so much the race. So we'll be able, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, the series so far has been very exciting. Uh, better than expected. A lot of people... I mean, there was more ratings for Monday Night Football when it was Seahawks-Vikings than Game 1 of the World Series. But uh, after Game 2, I think people got more excited. The Rays tied it up. Game 4 is bringing a spark, and now everybody wants to watch 5, 6, 7. Uh, It's definitely um, gotten more interesting as the series goes on, and it still is interesting as we head to Game 6 tomorrow night. Uh, Speaking of of Randy Arozarena, he sets an MLB record for nine home runs in a single postseason, or sets a an MLB record four home runs with nine in a single postseason. And then in game five, he set the record for hits in a single postseason with 27. What are your guys' thoughts on the emergence of Randy Arozarena? Jacob. Uh, I think it's definitely going to help him in his next contract. He's definitely going to get a big payday for this. Um, But he's really the leader that the Rays need. I mean, the Rays don't really have 
a bona fide superstar, at least I didn't think so, to lead them through a deep postseason run. So he's really stepped up at the right time for them. He's definitely the guy that they can look to to produce offense for them, which they definitely need that to make a World Series run like this. So really, it's good for him. He's back a hot, right place, right time. So it's just it's just a great emergence for him. Brendan? Yeah, so you see guys like this kind of just come up and surprise you in the postseason before, right? And then you don't really hear about them in the following years. I don't think that's the case with this guy. I love his bat. Um, I mean, being able, to, being able to set these records already, small sample size, short in season. Um, who knows if he would be able to do this through 162. Um, but definitely the spark that Tampa Bay needed. You guys, you had guys like Brandon Lowe um, not show up, not bring their bats to the World Series. I mean, to the postseason overall. A Rosa Arena definitely was able to help the team out and be the spark that they needed um, at the right time. A guy that I think likes the spotlight, shows up in the big games, and that's the kind of guy that Tampa Bay had been looking for for a while over the course of the past few years. Um, I think this is the start of a really good career for him and that he's not going to be a one-hit wonder. Yeah, I think it's a historic run, a fun run, and I agree with you guys. I think it's the start of a career. Um, was in Cardinals farm system last year, Got gets cut this preseason or spring training and the race pick up over waivers and uh, they're more than happy that they did that um they're not here with his production there's some games they don't win without his home runs or late game heroics game four they don't win without his three for four performance including a home run and yes he almost did botch the game winner but luckily the catcher <laughs> was able to come up with it and he was able to save face and did a little pat on home plate to make just to seal the deal. They're not here without him. The series is over without him. Um, they might not even be in the World Series without him. So I think it's huge for the Rays, and it's huge for him because it's it, like I said, the start of his career. Um, now, Game Six will be a home game for the Dodgers, um, but they will be facing Blake Snell, as you mentioned earlier, Brendan. Do the Dodgers get it done tomorrow night, or is this game going to seven? Brendan, I'll start with you. I do think we'll play a seventh game. I. I think Tampa Bay, I mean, the postseason brings a different energy to a ball club. Um, I think Tampa Bay, having been able to play in front of fans uh, for the first time uh, for five games so far, has helped them a little bit. I think they somehow get it done. Like I mentioned, they're playing uh, a below average pitcher in Gonsolin. Um, haven't, I don't even know how to analyze that guy. Um, just by looking at the numbers, it's not good. Um, so if guys like uh, G-Man Choi, uh, Kiermaier, Lowe, Meadows can get their bats going um, early on, I think the first few innings will be uh, the telling tale of how that game is going to go. If the Bay can get that early lead, then they'll be good to go um, to, win, <clears throat> to win game six and force a game seven. Jacob. I like the points you brought up, Brendan. I definitely think the race could possibly get it done, but I just look at the Dodgers team, their bats. I'm, I'm anticipating the bats to be hot in game six. They want to get it over with. I think that even though Blake Snell is pitching, I think they can still get to him. I have the Dodgers winning game six. They just have too talented of a roster, I think, to make this series go seven games. And, yeah, I think that they're going to get to Blake Snell early, and I think that they're going to end this series in six. I'm going to say it goes to seven. I think Blake Snell doesn't have a set. He, Yeah, he's two and two, but what you've noticed is he's had one performance well in the series, one bad, and he already had his bad performance in the series. I think game six he steps up. He knows he's the ace. He knows his role. I think this is the one game in the series where pitching really does matter, and I think the Rays take advantage of Gonsolin, and Snell and I, wins it for the Rays, I say, similar to game five, score four to two-ish, uh, but in favor of the Rays. And then game seven, there's no pitchers announced, but if it happens, you got to imagine – that the Rays will be sending out um, Yarborough or uh, Glasnow, and they, they have a slew, or even Charlie Martin, they have a slew of guys that can throw out there. You'd imagine Glasnow with the pro pro postseason he's having and the flow. I mean, it's October flow. It's all about the flow. But I think the Rays have the pitching that it takes to win the next two games. But like Brendan said, you need the bats, and if the bats can come around, I think the Rays can steal this one. And just based off the, the recent postseason history of the Dodgers, it's their kind of thing to make it and lose it. So 
Um, we'll see. These final two games are going to be exciting. If there is two games, game six tomorrow night, a big one as the Rays try to force a game seven. Um, before we get to the end here, an update from Monday Night Football before we go 7-3 Rams as it's 11 minutes left in the second quarter over the Bears. Now that's going to take us to our last call. And what this last call segment's going to be is just a few fun questions that maybe pertain to the season, um, that may pertain to sports, but sometimes they don't. All three tonight aren't going to pertain to sports. So here we go. Corn maze or haunted house? Jacob. I'll probably go corn maze. I just, I like figuring them out myself. I get pretty scared in haunted houses at times too, so I'm <laughs> going corn maze. All right, Brendan. All the times on what spirit you want to be in. Do you want to go full on Halloween? Or do you want to celebrate, you know, the actual season of fall? Um, I, mean, I like both personally. I love making fun of everything in haunted houses <laughs> just because how stupid they are um, when you go You're through it. Guys. I remember, I think I think we went through uh, Sigma News haunted house one time, Will. Oh, uh, uh, my, that wasn't Sigma News. That my was freshman that. year. Somebody else is a haunted house. Not us. It might be ATL. ATL, that was probably it. Um, but no, I like both. Um, I get frustrated in core mazes, actually, because I don't know where to go so i like <laughs> starts punching the hay <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um i would probably pick haunted house i'm not a big fan of corn mazes either i actually have a story of a corn maze we got on this like tractor trailer after the corn maze and i missed the step getting off and like face planets so and i am scarred for life from corn mazes but um haunted <laughs> houses never fallen off one of those um <laughs> So if you guys could go anywhere in the world to see the leaves change, where would you guys go? Brendan, I'll start with you. Um, I feel like states like Vermont or Maine are like known for this because they don't have anything else. Um, I mean, I think if you go into like the forests or woods up there, I think it, I think it would be like be pretty cool. Um, there's probably some hidden place that you that we don't know about on some other continent that it's fall all year round somehow. Um, that would be pretty cool. But, um, yeah, I don't know. That's kind of a tough question. Jacob. So mine's not scenic at all. Mine actually has to do with sports. Just imagine yourself. You're at the last row of first energy stadium. You, you're able to look over the shoulder. You're able to see those leaves falling. And then you're able to see Baker Mayfield lighten up, hopefully the Steelers defense, something like that. So I'm saying, Top of First Energy Stadium, watching the Browns get a victory, and watching the Leafs fall, that'd be perfect for me. I would say I'd stay here. Uh, I know, I, I believe it's Japan, like the flowers are blooming in the fall, and it's like a beautiful sight. But um, I don't know. I, I just love, it's something about Ohio's falls. They're chilly, but not like brutal football starting you get to watch, I mean, I don't know. I just love, Ohio Falls are the way to go. Hoodie season, sweater season, sweater weather, if you want to say that. Um, everyone, everyone loves fall. You ask anyone what yeah. their favorite season is, it's, it's fall. I don't think I'd change, really I don't think I'd change what I have for the fall season. Um, Halloween costumes. Guys, you got Halloween costumes picked out, Brendan, do you? Huh? Yeah, I'm going as the fly that went on Mike Pence's head. <laughs> love it. Love nah, <laughs> nah, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, I have no clue. If this year, I'm not even going to any any parties. It's like if you I mean, like really want to get into it, to, I don't think a lot of people yeah, are going to parties. Got, got to wear a mask, right? Got yeah. to wear a mask. Go as Black Panther. Honor Chadwick Boseman. There you go. Go as Black Panther. That's what I went for as Halloween last year, though. So I don't know if I can do it again. <laughs> Jacob. So for my FYS class, I have to dress up as a Dalmatian for like a class costume contest but if it was up to me given the times we should deliver a public service announcement i think i should dress up as hand sanitizer myself spread the good word of always cleaning those hands in these uncertain times so that's personally what i would pick so i'm walking with my sister and her son my nephew uh trick-or-treating wise and rosie and i are both gone so uh we're, we're picking between a couple of couples costumes i'm thinking either the joker and harley quinn star lord and gamora or i'm a pong cup She's a ping pong ball, and Loki's a beer. 
our dog back here is a beer, <laughs> but we're we're still discussing. She's not a fan of the the superhero ones. Like I I love Marvel, so I want to be Star Lord and Gamora, but she doesn't want to paint herself green. So we'll see. It's still a it's still a debate, but she needs to know that there's six days till Halloween, and whatever we got to do, we got to decide quick. So go as go as the bubble. Dress up in LeBron James uniform and wear <laughs> one of those like bubble balls around you. <laughs> that would be amazing, but. All right, so for Will Brianza, Jacob Butar, Brenda Devenny, we thank you all for listening to episode one here of Raiders on the Podcast. We'll be back next Monday for episode two. Um, but other than that, everybody that's listening, you all have a wonderful day, night, whatever time you're listening. Just make sure it's wonderful. Thank you, guys.